Steve, what a wonderful hymn of the church. I love to tell the story. Friends, for the next few moments, which are ours, allow me to focus our attention on this theme of encouragement. Simply stated, it's not over. It's not over. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward into this time of impartation where you can impart to us, speak to us, offer and equip us with your word of hope and redemption, your word of encouragement and inspiration as we yield ourselves to your will and to your way that you might use us as your instruments of grace, glory, and praise. That those who cross our paths might see your light shining brightly in us. I now decrease and ask that you would increase that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. And all God's people together said, Amen. Sometimes in life, friends, we endure situations and challenges and obstacles that shake us to the core of our faith. We pray fervently, but it appears God has not heard, or worse yet, that God is ignoring us. Doesn't God know the desperate situation that we find ourselves in? Doesn't God know, see, and understand that we are at our wit's end? Doesn't God understand and know that that we have and we need something right now? We are in desperate straits. Doesn't God understand and didn't God make us the promise that all we needed to do was to ask and God will give it to us, that God will never leave us nor forsake us? But sometimes it certainly feels like God has left us all alone. Yes, There are times when the odds are stacked against us, when our situations and challenges and obstacles feel overwhelming. Yet, friends, let me offer you this word of encouragement. God has not abandoned us. God never abandons us. God is preparing a miracle for us so that we will know that nothing is impossible for God. It's not over. Mary and Martha, brothers, Lazarus is sick. They send word to Jesus. You have probably heard this story before. This is the first instance of resurrection that we've ever heard in the Bible. No one before Lazarus has gotten up from the dead. We've seen people who made transition while they were still alive. We've seen people disappear, but but no one ever raised from the dead. And so uh, Mary and Martha say, Lazarus is sick. Send for his good friend Jesus. Now, Now, pause for a minute. It's good to be able to say, my good friend Jesus. We sing about what a friend we have in Jesus. What? I thought I had some folks who knew some hymns. Uh, What a privilege it is to carry everything. What a friend we have in Jesus. Mary and Martha said, we're going to talk to you. We're going to sin for Jesus. Because as soon as Jesus hears that Lazarus is dead, his good friend, we know Jesus is going to drop everything and come see about his friend Lazarus. Well, the text tells us that when the messenger goes to Jesus, says, Jesus, Mary and Martha have sent me to tell you that Lazarus is sick and they're worrying about him dying. I'm sure the messenger was expecting Jesus to say, well, let's get everything and let's go. And so as the messenger starting to head around, he, he turns around and looks back and says, Jesus, you're not, you're not. <laughs> and what Jesus says is, is profound. He says, this sickness will not result in death. Mary Martha told me to come get you. I told you, we're supposed to be leaving. Jesus says, no, 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 no. This sickness will not result in death. And what the text tells us is what sometimes hurts us to our core. Jesus stayed where he was another two days. Lord, don't you know how desperate we are? Don't you know that I'm at my wit's end? Don't you understand that, that this situation that I'm going through is untenable? Don't you understand that I'm feeling overwhelmed? Why would you stay another two days when you know I'm in trouble? I'm your good friend, at least on most days. Don't you understand? I've been in church all my life. I show up every time. Yes, I'm still working some things out, but, but Jesus, I expect you to be there when I call. Why are you waiting to rescue me? Why are you waiting to come see about me? We've dismissed what Jesus says. He says, don't worry about this. This will not result in what you think it will be. Although right now it hurts, although right now your imagination is running wild with you and you're saying to yourself that this is going to be the worst thing ever, Jesus says to us, don't worry, it's not going to result in the worst thing ever to happen. It's not over just because you can't see a possibility. I'm telling you, it will not happen the way you think it will. 
So Jesus turns and goes back to what he was doing, probably ministering to the needs of hurting and broken people, probably healing some sick, teaching some folks, probably offering some hope and joy to people where he was who, who were saying to themselves, uh-oh, Jesus is getting ready to leave, and, and I, my baby hasn't been blessed yet, my, my situation hasn't been touched yet, my, 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 I haven't had a chance to get close enough to hear Jesus for myself. And, and to their surprise, Jesus says, no, 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 I'm here for another two days. The messenger returns to, to Mary and Martha and says, um, I got some good news and I got some bad news. And Mary and Martha could already see what the bad news is. We told you to go get Jesus. You came back. Where's Jesus? Well, that's the bad news. Jesus says something cryptic, something along the lines that this will not end up in death. That it is some, you know, something along. You know how Jesus does. He talks his riddles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, you ask him when he gets here. I don't understand what he said. But the good news is he said something that it won't result in something, whatever we thought it was going to be. So that's good news. Now, let's do some, some biblical math for a moment. Let's do some biblical math for a moment. Because the text tells us that when Jesus finally arrives, that Lazarus has been dead and in a tomb for how long? Four days. Four days. Now, I'm not a mathematician, and I, I, I did okay in math, but I'm not a math scholar. My daughter's a math scholar, but no, no, no. Uh, um, you took two extra days. By the time you got there, let's say it took a day and a half. Uh, that's three and a half days. By the time you got there, he was already in the tomb four days. Now, Jewish burial rites means that when you die, they immediately bury you. So uh, within the time that the messenger got to you, Lazarus had died. Y'all follow me. Everybody on the same page, right? We're good. We're good. Two days. You stayed there. If you had come back within those two days, Lazarus would have still died. Because he's in the tomb for? So Mary and Martha's plea, if you had just been here, Lazarus would not have died. It's not actually true. Now, we understand that feeling. We understand that plight. If you've ever had someone close to you die and you prayed, Lord, heal them, provide them with some miraculous miracle, and they still died, you ask, Lord, Lord, why did you bring life to this situation that I prayed for fervently and it still happened the way I thought it was going to happen? We can understand their grief, their overcome, that their brother beloved is dead. And Jesus, upon coming, and they hear you took two extra days to get here. Why did you take two extra days? Maybe something could have happened if you got here sooner. Although we're not doing the basic math that, that he died. Even if Jesus had come when we sent for him, he would have still died. That's a humbling thing for us to Negotiate with that our faith does not guarantee that our prayers will be answered the way we want them to be answered. That our challenge as maturing people of faith is to have the kind of faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, or Mishael, I forgot the other two Hebrew names, y'all excuse me, my, my Hebrew memory is, is escaping me. The kind of faith that they had when they said, we know the Lord could deliver us, but even if God doesn't, we're still going to praise God anyhow. That's mature faith. That's a maturing to a point of recognizing that my relationship with God is not dependent on God doing for me what I want done when I want done. That I'm not looking at God to be a teller machine or a vending machine that I put in my prayers and what comes out is what I want right when I want it. Although if you've ever been to a vending machine, every now and again, you push the buttons and uh, what happens? Uh, it gets stuck. Uh, and some of us uh, know that whole hip movement. Uh. That didn't work? Okay, we're going to go to the other side. <laughs> to try to shake it free, and then sometimes it doesn't shake free, and you have to do what? Call the number on the machine and say, I, I lost 50, well, not 50 cents. It ain't 50, 50 cents in a while. I lost $2 in this machine trying to get this candy bar I could have got from the store for $1.50. fifty. Why don't you answer when we call? And what we have to remind ourselves of is what Jesus says. What you think is about to happen is not really what's going to happen. That what you prayed for, that what you're looking for, you're, you're asking me to do something very narrow, but I'm trying to expand your horizons to imagine that maybe what you asked for for that loved one to have peace is no more pain. But no more pain means they come with me and they're no longer with you. 
that maybe what you're asking for in the transition and the hardship of what you're going through in your family is that sometimes you have to distance yourself from folks who may be blood relatives but have no good intention for you. That maybe what you're praying for, I'm answering, but not in the way that you want for it, but what's going to be beneficial for you and give glory to God later. That's when we know that we're maturing as people of faith. When we can still love God and praise God when God doesn't do things the way we want them done, when we want them done, how we want them done. When God disregards our personal preferences, says, I've got something bigger in mind, something broader in store, and we can still say, you know what, Lord? I'd rather have your plan than my plan because my plan has faults and flaws in it that I can't see that you can see. So, Lord, whatever you're going to do, I know that it's not over just because what I see tells me it is. Jesus comes, meets Mary and Martha, and Mary and Martha are weeping, and there are those who are mourning and weeping as well. Lazarus is dead. Lazarus has had uh, has great reputation, well respected in and around the city of Bethany. And when Martha and Mary are weeping, uh, we have that one phrase. Uh, I'm not sure how many of y'all uh, had this tradition around Thanksgiving that around Thanksgiving uh, everyone had to say something they were thankful for and a scripture. Uh, And one of the scriptures that us as kids, we all wanted to be the first one to be able to speak because we would say the one scripture that we knew real quick, Jesus wept. (laughs) Didn't have to do the 23rd Psalm, didn't have to do uh, John 3.16, didn't have to do any of those others. If you were the first kid, you got a chance to say, Jesus wept. And we see Jesus Weeping over his friend, weeping over the anguish. So Jesus and God understands our plight. He knows what we're going through. Jesus weeps for us and Jesus weeps with us. But Jesus understands it's not over. Take me to where he is. And the text tells us, uh, Jesus, you know he's been dead four days. And he's been in the tomb four days. And without going into any graphic detail, uh, after a a day or two, uh, your body starts doing some things that can't be undone. That there is an odor and an aroma that starts to happen uh, during day two and a half into three. That's one of the reasons why we embalm, so that those things can be stayed off. They said it's been four days, Jesus. Uh, If we roll this stone away, uh, there isn't enough uh, ointment and, and, and stuff that you can stuff in your nose that's going to help you deal with the smell of what happens when we roll the stone away. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. Roll the stone away. Take me to where he is. They roll the stone away. The stench comes out of the tomb. So we smell what we know is true. But you told us to do something we haven't seen yet. So we're going to believe it's not over, even though our nose tells us it's over, our eyes tells us it's over, our ears are telling us it's over because everybody's weeping and crying. But we're ready to see you do something we've never seen before. And Jesus says to Lazarus, get up, come out. Now, I can imagine that there were probably some folks like me who were a little analytical in our understanding and saying, okay, uh, he did. (laughs) I I know you're the great prophet, but again, none of us have ever seen what's about to happen happen. None of us have ever heard of what's about to happen happening ever in history, never recorded that what's about to happen has happened. And so when Jesus says, get up, we're half looking and saying, all right, Jesus, we just need you to be convinced that what's happened has happened. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Sometimes the hardest thing for us to deal with is to walk with someone through a season of grief where they're refusing to believe what has ended is ended. It's not over. There's still some hope. There's still some possibility for reconciliation. No, it is done. And Jesus says to us, some things do come into those places of being complete and they're done and we move you to a place of acceptance and overcoming those. But this one thing, friends, is not over. Lazarus, get up and come out. And so they start to see movement and someone starts walking out of the tomb. Now the text doesn't say this, but I'm using my Holy Ghost imagination, that I'm sure somebody fainted. I'm sure somebody ran I'm sure somebody hollered because we're seeing something we've never seen before. And a dead man just walked out of a tomb. That don't happen. No, 
We've never seen that. And Lazarus, even himself, is realizing, wait a minute. I know I was sick. I know I took my last breath. But I heard a voice saying, get up. And Lazarus didn't say, well, wait a minute, maybe, 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 this, this is, maybe this is my transition point. Maybe I'm in, in purgatory. Maybe I'm just hearing voices before I make my transition to wherever I'm going to be. Uh, no, I'm, I'm hearing a voice telling me to do something I've never done before. He gets up, comes out of the tomb, and what Jesus says to the people is, take off his grave clothes. Take off the things that remind him of who he used to be. And what used to happen. Take off the things that convince you that I can't do the impossible. Take off the things that limit and hinder you from believing that there's a possibility where you can't see possibility. Take it off and enjoy what God is doing because God can do the impossible. So they take off his grave clothes, give him something to eat, and everyone is sitting around looking at Lazarus. And you, you've ever been in those situations where everyone's looking at you? You know everybody's looking at you, like y'all are looking at me today. And you're looking into faces, and you know some of the faces are like, ah, when this is going to be over, I got dinner plans, the rain is still hard. You know folks are like, I got something to do after this, my grandkids coming over, I didn't, did I remember to turn off the iron? I don't know if I remember to turn off the iron. Did I turn off the, did I make sure that I put all the things that are running through his head? And people are looking at Lazarus, and Lazarus is looking at them like, I don't know either. (laughs) We're experiencing something we've never experienced before. And Jesus is reminding them, yes, I can do the impossible. Yes, I can do something that you never conceived of. You thought I had to be here in order to heal him, to keep him from dying. I told you it would not result in death. The death that you thought was going to be final, this was just a nap. So that I might offer you an opportunity to see that I can do what no one else can do. Jesus says, your brother is alive. He's brought back to you, and Lazarus goes on and continues his ministry, and I'm, I'm sure that there was somebody uh, in his town of Bethany that every time they saw Lazarus, they, they did one of those, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess he's, he's alive and well, no, no. He's warm, he ain't cold, no, 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 doesn't stick, no. But he's now a living testament that what you think is impossible is possible. So that when Jesus starts telling them, in three days you will destroy this temple, but I will raise it up again. I am going to the Father. Yes, there's a possibility that you couldn't see. Yes, crucifixion is going to be horrible. Yes, the things seem overwhelming, but it's not over. There is a possibility yet awaiting. And friends, that is the mark of our faith. That's how we know that we're maturing as people of faith. When we're able to say, Lord, I don't know how. I don't know what. But you say that there's possibility. So I'm going to trust and keep my eyes and ears open to hear your word of instruction, to see what you're going to do, to understand that there's something that I cannot perceive and conceive of that is going to bless not only my life, but the life of everyone around. Jesus goes to the tomb, raises Lazarus. Lazarus goes on to continue spreading the gospel, sharing with his sisters the great joy of resurrection and hope in Christ, that Jesus is unlike any other prophet, unlike anyone else they've experienced, and that if you follow this wonderful man, that if you follow his teachings, things in your life will change. Now, let me say this, because sometimes we hear this message, it's not over, and we, we believe that God can fix everything, and therefore we can make bigger messes and know God's going to fix it. You have to understand what we talked about last week, consequences and repercussions. Yes, God is saying to you, it's not over, but I need you to partner with me to see and do impossible things. Jesus didn't roll the stone away from the tomb. He said, roll it away. Jesus didn't take off Lazarus' grave clothes. He said, take them off. Jesus didn't give Lazarus something to eat. He says, you give them something to eat. 
says, I need you to partner with me to believe the impossible because I know how you are as children of God. Sometimes you got to see it, feel it, touch it for yourself for it to help you mature in your faith. God can do the impossible when faithful, faith-filled persons are willing to see and partner with God to do the impossible. When we stand on our belief that God will take those things meant to destroy us and transform them into something that blesses our lives and the lives of those around us, that the worst thing that happens to us is not the last thing that happens to us, but it can be the thing that catapults us to a new understanding and a deeper relationship with God. When the weight seems too heavy, friends, remind yourself not to throw in the towel, for God says, It's not over.